Hey BioKids, this is Mr. Wolf, and today we're going to start talking about probably one of the most important molecules found in biology, and that's DNA. Today we're going to focus on the structure, which is what the molecule looks like. Eventually we're going to get into what the molecule actually does, which is called its function. So let's begin. The first thing I'd like you to do is try this note-taking strategy. What we're going to do for this unit, while we talk about the structure and function of DNA, is try what's called split column notes. So on a piece of notebook paper, what I'd like you to do is take out a pen and make a column, a two-column chart in your notes. And you're going to title one side the structure, which we'll talk about today, and the other side will be the function. So as you watch these videos, when I talk about things that relate to DNA structure, you take those notes over here, and maybe you draw like the pictures that I have in the PowerPoint. Um, and then when I talk about function, you take those notes over there and draw any pictures that you seem fit to draw um, for the function. So that's how we're going to take some notes in this unit. So when we start talking about DNA, we always have to start with this most important concept called the central dogma. This is known as the central dogma of biology. It's basically how all living things work. And we start with our DNA molecule. DNA is the center of our central dogma. It always starts with this molecule of DNA. Now, the central dogma of biology states that DNA is what's used to make RNA, which eventually is used to make proteins. And these proteins are what give us all of our characteristics. It's why you have brown hair, it's why you might have blue eyes, it's the reason why you have a certain blood type. All the traits about you are all kind of governed by these proteins, but the instructions for making those proteins are found in our DNA. So what we're going to start today, or talk about today, is what does this molecule actually look like? So what is our DNA? Now a lot of you know that DNA is this special name called the double helix or twisted ladder. It looks something like this. We have this nice spiral shaped looking molecule. Now this DNA molecule comes in smaller sections called genes and genes are basically sections of DNA that code for specific things. Um, and those codes are found in the letters of DNA A's, T's, C's, and G's. We'll talk more about this a little bit later. In our cells, the DNA is stored in a version called a chromosome. A chromosome is basically a really condensed form of DNA, and it has this X shape to it. Um, the DNA is tightly wound and packed into what structure that holds the DNA, especially in our cells, it's called the nucleus. But we'll talk more about these two sides later. Today we're focusing just on what does this molecule actually look like. So what does DNA look like? So here's our double helix. We see uh, this twisted ladder shape here. But what's actually making up this ladder? Well, this ladder is composed of two nucleotide strands. And a nucleotide consists of a phosphate group, which is a phosphorus, and a bunch of oxygens that surround it. A pentose sugar gets that name pentose from that it has five sides to it. And then a nitrogenous or a nitrogen-containing base. You can see here there are other nitrogens found in that base. This base happens to be adenine. So those are our parts of the nucleotide that make up the bigger structure of DNA. Now notice we can see those, nucle those, those nucleotides in this double helix. There's the phosphate, there's the sugar, and then there's the nitrogenous base. So there is our nucleotide and all DNA really is is a repeated sequence of those nucleotides all bonded together to form this ribbon-like structure. Now when we look at the nitrogen bases found in DNA, they come in two different forms. They come in what are called purines, which have two rings to their structure. The purines are located here, this dark green one, this, this adenine, you can see it has two rings of nitrogen to it. And then guanine down here, which also has two rings of nitrogens to it. Now notice the sugar and the phosphate for these two bases, or these two nucleotides, are the same. We still have this pentose sugar and we have this phosphate group. So those are the purines, two rings to them. And then the pyrimidines right here, thymine, has only one ring. And then cytosine down here also has only one ring. So purines have two rings, pyrimidines have only one ring. So how do we figure out how this molecule is actually put together? It was a mystery for a long time what this molecule actually looked like. Um, it wasn't until a scientist by the name of Erwin Shargoff actually analyzed the amount of nitrogenous bases found in DNA that we actually had a clue to its structure. 
So what, what Ern Shorgoff did was he looked at different organisms and he basically compiled data about how much adenine, how much thymine, how much guanine, how much cytosine were found in the DNA molecule. And what he found in almost every instance, in fact every instance, the, especially like E. coli and the yeast, the herring, which is a fish, a rat, and a human, he found that the amount of guanine was almost always equal to the amount of cytosine. Like 25% of the E. coli's DNA was guanine and 25% of it was cytosine. He found the same to be true for like yeast cells and herring cells and rat cells and even human cells. He also found the same thing with adenine and thymine, that the percentage of the molecule was almost always the same. 31% adenine in the yeast cell, 32.9% in thymine. And this led to what are called Shargoff's rules, that in a DNA molecule you always have to have equal amounts of cytosine and guanine and equal amounts of adenine and thymine. It wasn't until several years later that we actually figured out how those molecules actually, how the guanine and the cytosine and the adenine and thymine actually bond together in this molecule. We figured out that they were formed that they form these things called hydrogen bonds. And this is actually the reason why we have the same amount. So Shargoff said that we have to have the same amount of cytosine and guanine, and that is because cytosine always bonds to guanine in DNA. And if you look closely, these dotted lines represent the hydrogen bonds that hold those two bases together. Guanine can form three, and cytosine can form three, which is why they form that pair. Adenine and thymine can only form two hydrogen bonds. And so we see those two bonds there, so adenine always bonds to thymine, thymine always bonds to adenine, cytosine bonds to guanine, and that's what holds the two sides of the DNA molecule together. If you notice, DNA really is two nucleotide strands that are just connected together by the nitrogen bases. So here is one strand of nucleotides. We call this the sugar phosphate backbone. So there's the sugar, there's the phosphate, sugar and a phosphate, sugar and a phosphate. That's the backbone. And the nitrogen bases kind of reach out over the middle and connect to the other side. So there is the other side right here. So there's one nucleotide strand, there's the other nucleotide strand. And they're really held together by these weak hydrogen bonds down the middle. But we always follow these hydrogen bonding rules that were figured out by Shargoff, C bonds to G, A bonds to T. And if you notice, a purine, like adenine, always bonds to a pyrimidine, like thymine. A double ring structure, like guanine, always bonds to a single ring structure, like cytosine. And those are the bonding rules. So how do we actually figure out that this molecule had two sides to it? And it was this double helix structure held together by these weak hydrogen bonds. It took two very brilliant scientists and a lot of collaboration with others to figure this problem out. And so you're going to watch this video on how James Watson, one of the most famous biologists ever, figured out with his partner, Francis Crick, how this complementary base pairing works. The Cavendish shop was to build us some tin models, and that took too long. And, uh, you know, finally in desperation, I made some other cardboard. I began moving them around, and I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small, molecule and uh, so how did you do it somehow you had to to form link bonds so uh, here's uh, a and here's t and uh, i wanted this hydrogen to point directly at this nitrogen so i had something like this Ooh. so then i went to the, the pair and wanted this nitrogen to point to this one and i went like this Whoa, they look the same. And you can put one right on top of the other. We knew we could just, you know, even if we go up to the ceiling, we were building a, a tiny fraction of a molecule. Hundred of million of these base pairs in one molecule, all fitting into this wonderful symmetry which we saw, you know, the morning of February 28th, uh, 1953. 
I find it so fascinating that James Watson and Francis Crick could figure this kind of stuff out before all the modern technology we have today. It's pretty amazing that back in the 1950s, they discovered the structure of DNA. And they, and they, and they termed it the ladder. So here's our ladder. Like any ladder, we have uprights, which consist of our sugars and our phosphates. So there's one side of the ladder, and there's the other side. Just the repeating phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar backbone. And then the rungs of our ladder are those nitrogen bases that reach across and are held together by hydrogen bonds that connect the two sides of the molecule together. So we have our sugar phosphate backbone, the sides of the uprights, and our nitrogen bases forming the rungs. And there's our ladder. So the accepted model of DNA, which was proposed by Watson and Crick in 1953, is very similar to a twisted ladder. We have two nucleotide strands twisting around each other with those nitrogen bases holding the ladder together in the middle. I hope you found this interesting.